In the grand tapestry of time, few inventions have truly echoed through the ages. But some, they're not just inventions, they become legends. Picture this, Tokyo, Japan, a city that never sleeps, an emblem of relentless pursuit of perfection. Here amidst the bustle of innovation, a legend was born. Crafted with precision and care, it emerged not merely as a car, but as a beacon of power and performance. It dared to redefine the limits, break the mold, challenge the norms. It held a promise, a promise of raw power, unmatched speed and breathtaking style. It wasn't just a car, it was an emotion, a culture, a legacy. It kicked sand in the faces of those European sports cars with their snooty pedigrees and gave them a taste of raw Japanese power. This machine didn't just run on asphalt, it sprinted through cinema screens, blazed trails across the digital world of games and became an anthem of a generation that still exists today. From humble origins to its iconic status, it was a journey that transformed the world's perspective of Japanese performance and design. This is the story of the Toyota Supra. To truly understand the legend that is the Supra, we must journey back through time. Back to a Japan rising from the ashes. A nation poised at the threshold of innovation. In the land of the rising sun, a way of life thrives. A philosophy that transcends mere practice. Kaizen, the belief in continuous improvement. The quest for perfection in every small detail. Never perfect, always improving. It was in this fertile soil that the 2000 GT was planted, a seed that would grow to redefine Japan's automotive landscape, a masterpiece that challenged Western dominance, a statement of style and of substance. The 2000 GT wasn't just a car, it was a symphony of engineering and aesthetics, a shining beacon that marked Japan's arrival on the world stage. But the spirit of the 2000 GT was not to remain confined to the archives of history. It whispered through the hallways of Toyota, like a restless dream, a thirst that cannot be quenched. We must excel. We must surpass. We must go beyond. This is Eyewitness News, Wednesday, March 8th. 1978. This was the age of disco. Glittering dance floors mirrored a time of cultural upheaval and rebirth. John Travolta was defining cool with every twist and turn in Greece. Tell me about it, stir. Thanks, Sandy. Space Invaders was ushering in a new era of digital entertainment, sparking a worldwide gaming craze. Meanwhile, in Japan's industrious corner, a revolution on four wheels was brewing. Toyota was dreaming big, imagining something beyond ordinary. You see, at this time, the streets were ruled by European flair and American muscle. To challenge this dominance was audacious. In the early days, Datsun, later Nissan, chipped away at this dominance with their Z car, a blend of European-inspired design without the European price, making sports car dreams suddenly reachable for many. Toyota saw the Z car success and were determined to surpass it. And in April 1978, the Supra, known initially as the Celica XX, was unveiled in Japan. Soon enough, the Supra began showing off its prowess across the pond. This is sporty and powerful. This gives me comfort and pleasure. But I'd like both in one car. Supra. The incredible new Toyota Celica Supra, the powerful pleasure. Supra. You got it. Interior touches that are unexpected. Supra, you got it. Six fuel injected cylinders. Supra, count on it because it's built by Toyota. The Supra's arrival in the American market in 1978 couldn't have been timed better. In the throes of the 70s gas crisis, Americans needed something different. Soaring gas prices and shortages led American consumers to reconsider their traditionally large gas guzzling vehicles and seek out more fuel efficient alternatives. I've been in two gas lines already and I'm out of gas. Dead out. 
Japanese automakers, including Toyota, were well positioned to meet this demand. Their vehicles were generally smaller, more efficient, and more reliable than their American counterparts. The Supra was just the answer. Inside, it offered 70s extravagance, with power windows, tilt steering wheel, and a state-of-the-art stereo. As 1980 rolled around, the Supra was recharged with a 2.8-litre 5ME engine, pumping out 116 horsepower. You might be tempted to laugh at this figure today, but let's get some perspective. At this time, the Porsche 924 was scraping by with 110 horsepower. The BMW 32i was managing 101 horsepower. And even the American-made V8 Ford Mustang with an engine approaching twice the size only managed to produce 134 horsepower. Meanwhile, Toyota's Supra was giving drivers style, performance, and excitement, all wrapped in 116 well-utilized horses. And if you had the Japanese delivered 2.6 litre version, you were getting 138 horsepower. Look, I know what you're thinking. And you're right, that's no 911. The 320i, that's the car your posh grandma drove to the supermarket. And the Mustang, the gas crisis had that car on its knees. But amidst the loud chorus of European and American sports cars with their long legacies, the Mark I Supra humbly took the stage. Born during the gas crisis, it was Toyota's poised answer to a changing world, a mix of agility and efficiency. Overlooked at first, it was the dawn of something legendary. I've got it right here in front of me. He has missed nine days. I asked for a car, I got a computer. The dawn of the 80s marked the rise of the personal computer. Aerobics classes were all the rage. Now we're ready to work those buns. And the streets echoed with the sound of boom boxes. While technology leaped and pop culture danced to new rhythms, the car world was gearing up again. Amidst the intensifying rivalry between European flair, American muscle and Japanese precision, cars were becoming more than just transportation. They were statements of style and performance. Toyota, right in the wave of success and a boom in Japanese economy, introduced the second generation, the A60, commonly referred to as the Mark II Supra. Presenting the new Toyota Supra and Dan Gurney. It takes the right stuff to make a great performance car. Come ride with Dan Gurney and see. It's quick off the line. That's the twin cam fuel injected engine. Now let's see the independent four wheel suspension in action. It handles well. Nice brakes. The new Toyota Celica Supra. That's the right stuff. Outside of Japan, Toyota introduced the Supra with two new distinct variants. The feisty P-Type that stood for performance and the suave L-Type that screamed luxury. Its design was more aerodynamic with a drag coefficient of 0.32, decent for its time. Meanwhile, taking styling cues from the late 70s and early 80s wedge-shaped sports cars and those snazzy pop-up headlights, so cool. The A60 was packed with advancements, both under the hood and in its interior, as Toyota aimed to stake its claim in the performance car segment and had the cash to do so. The first models came with a 2.8-litre 5M GE engine, but with a higher compression ratio of 8.8 to 1, and now was double overhead can. This helped the new Supra pump out 145 horsepower. Toyota wasn't messing around anymore with the double overhead cam 5M GE engine. This car was getting fast. Unless you lived in Australia, Sweden or Switzerland, we got more of the same. The A60 Supra had its suspension fine-tuned with the expertise from British automaker Lotus. But before you make any hasty judgments, remember, Lotus wasn't brought on board to give lessons on how to make the Supra a roadside attraction. Lotus's influence made sure the Supra didn't just hug the road, it waltzed with it. Not one to rest on its laurels, the Supra kept all its previous features while adding a few more goodies to its arsenal. 
For instance, cruise control, climate control, digital dash in some variants, a limited slip diff, headlight washers, a turbocharger, only in Japan, <laughs> cool stickers, rack and pinion steering, four wheel disc brakes, a retractable reading light, the kitchen sink, and even a tire with a tread pattern specific to this Supra. Honestly, I think James Bond would have been jealous of this car. Not exactly Christmas, is it? Were you expecting an exploding pen? Toyota's marriage of luxury, performance and innovation was starting to make ripples in the sports car genre. By the end of the A60's model's run, the pinnacle of its performance could be found in Japan, with the most potent variant boasting 173 horsepower. But the Super story is far from over. Nineteen eighty six. The world stood on the precipice of change. As Top Gun sent shivers down spines and fighter jets ruled the skies. Young men left theatres with dreams of flight. Roaring engines, burning rubber, and tires squealing down the street. They wanted speed, they wanted power, they wanted to feel the rush of the open road, just as Maverick felt in the sky. In the rearview mirror was the oil crisis of the 70s. Oh, so long, gay boys! Fuel prices had stabilised, countries around the world could smell the economic prosperity in the air, creating a resurgence in the interest of performance vehicles. In this electric atmosphere, Toyota's answer to a world hungry for power and style was unleashed. The third generation Supra, starting to live up to the Supra name. Elegant, yet aggressive. The Mark III era had dawned. You shaped it in your mind. Total performance. Now the all new Toyota Supra brings it alive. Super Power, created by a 3-liter, 24-valve, 200-horsepower engine. Super Suspension, racing-type, double wishbone, fully independent. Super Cockpit, where you perform. The new Toyota Super, performance without compromise. Now the Super Dynasty begins. In 1986, the Supra and the Celica faced a crossroads. You don't want me here anymore? No, that's not it, pal. You just gotta go away for a little while. How long am I going away for? I don't wanna lie to you. I don't think we're gonna be seeing each other anymore. Ready or not, they had to go their own ways. But I want my own ass! I want my own ass! I know! While the Celica transformed into a front-wheel drive sports coupe, our beloved Supra doubled down on the rear-wheel drive platform. Toyota's 7MGE engine was shoehorned in, a proud addition to their long evolution of M engines, with a turbo version offered from 87 on, delivering 231 horsepower. This was a huge leap forward. To make things more interesting, the turbo model was one of the first distributorless engines in the US, using a three-coil wasted spark setup. With the Mark III Supra, Toyota stood at the forefront of innovation, showcasing their ability to rival both mainstream and luxury brands in technological advancements. We were introduced to Thames, an adjustable suspension system offering driver-selectable settings with an automatic setting that would activate during heavy braking or high-speed maneuvers. Another standout was the acoustic control induction system. This technology adjusted the length of the intake runner, improving power output and torque curve. Further distinguishing the turbocharged models were the additional features of an engine oil cooler, intercooler and integrated rear spoiler. Every year, post 86, the Super saw upgrades and changes, design alterations, new color themes, enhanced power output and tech upgrades. The Supra kept cranking the dial up to 11. However, the Mark III was not without its criticisms. This car had gained weight due to all the luxury amenities. It could be 359 kilos heavier than its predecessor. Despite its critics, the Mark III Supra became the best-selling Supra of all time. 
In 1988, Toyota took the Supra to the racetrack, stemming from the stringent requirements of the Group A Japanese Touring Car Championship, they introduced the Turbo A, a limited edition variant. To qualify for Group A Touring Car races, Toyota had to produce a minimum of 500 Turbo A models for public purchase. Under the hood, the Turbo A sported a more potent 7M GTE U engine, delivering an impressive 274 horsepower. Innovations such as a map system, unique CT26 turbo, and a beefier throttle body made it a technical marvel. But its journey on the racetrack was a roller coaster. It shone in the JTCC with teams like Toms and Sards pushing this car to its limits, but it wasn't all podiums and champagne. The Supra faced fierce competition. It battled against agile titans like the Ford Sierra Cosworth, the nimble BMW M3, and the dominant Nissan Skyline GTR. Outside of Japan, and surprisingly not often discussed, the Mark III Supra carved a name for itself in Australia. In the Group E Australian production car series, this beast went head to head with the likes of Holden Commodores, Nissan Skylines, Mazdas, Fords and Hondas. And it didn't just compete, the Supra dominated. So much so, that like another Japanese car we all know and love, it was eventually banned from Group E racing. But the story doesn't end there. When his turbocharged Toyota Supra was banned from racing two years ago, John Burke gave his car to his wife as a shopping vehicle. But when the James Hardy was announced, Mrs Burke went back to the family Corolla. And John began the daunting task of making his Supra last for 12 hours on Australia's most demanding circuit. And like John Burke, other Supra teams were dusting the cobwebs off their cars, ready to compete at Bathurst. When it finally got the green light to race again, it was pitted against incredible opponents like the Nissan 300ZX from Gary Rogers Racing and a Holden Commodore piloted by no other than nine-time, at the time, Bathurst winner Peter Brock. God rest his soul. At the end of the gruelling day, the Supra, driven by Peter Fitzgerald and Alan Grice, was not only the winner, but was the laps ahead of second place. It marked a historic moment. The Mark III Supra became the first Japanese car to win the Bathurst 12 hour. While its racing chapter came to a close in 1993, it was time for the A70 to take a bow. But you know what they say about endings? They are just the start of a new chapter. And oh boy, was this next chapter fucking wild. Ah, the unmistakable sound of 1993. The World Wide Web took its first tentative steps. And what about this internet thing? Do you, do you know anything about that? Sure. <laughs> what, what the hell is that exactly? Well, it's, it's become a place where people are publishing information, and it's wild what's going on. You can send electronic mail to people. Uh, it is the big new thing. Internet, eh? <laughs> On TV screens, sitcom laughs echoed, dominating our evenings. No, no, see, that's no good. See, you don't know how to act. <laughs> These pretzels are making me thirsty! And who could forget the ritual of a Friday night trip to Blockbuster? But amid these familiar sights and sounds, our lives were about to change in ways we couldn't even imagine. While we were logging onto the internet for the first time, something extraordinary was secretly logging miles on the streets, hidden beneath the bodies of A70s, ensuring Toyota's designs remained away from prying eyes and eager competitors, was a car that would defy all expectations. In a marketplace dominated by established sports car brands, Toyota, still the underdog, knew they couldn't just blend in. To compete, they had to create an object of desire. Anything less, and they'd be swallowed up by the titans of the industry. This is a line. To some, it is seen as a barrier. To others, it's a point where traditions of the past are abandoned in favor of visions of the future. Introducing the revolutionary new Toyota Supra. It's taken everything sports cars were before and crossed the line. 
Toyota's message about crossing the line wasn't mere marketing fluff. The Mark IV Supra was a game changer, willing to square off with automotive legends costing twice as much. Whether it was holding its own against the Ferrari 355 on the track, or edging out a Lamborghini Diablo in a quarter mile, the Supra made its point. It was not to be underestimated. Flexing their engineering muscle, Toyota made it clear they could play in the same league as other high-end manufacturers. To make the Mark IV a supercar contender, it needed to be lighter. So aluminium was used in the bonnet, roof, control arms, the front cross member, and other various components. The fuel tank was redesigned to be more compact and was made out of plastic. High strength steel was strategically used to maintain structural integrity while shedding weight. The rear spoiler was injected with gas so it would be lighter but keep its form at high speed. Heck, even the carpet fibers were hollowed out to save weight. These changes made for a total weight saving of nearly 100 kilos. The Supra also underwent extensive wind tunnel testing to achieve a drag coefficient of just 0.31, making it one of the most aerodynamic cars of its time. To rein in this beast, Toyota didn't hold back on the brakes. Larger ventilated discs were used all around and a jump from two to four piston calipers on the turbo models. These enhancements weren't just for show. In 1997, the Supra set a world record in stopping distance, a record that wasn't broken until 2004 by the Porsche 911 Carrera GT. And even then, it was by less than a metre. Under the sculpted bonnet sat what the Supra is perhaps best known for, the 2JZ. Even today, the name 2JZ is spoken with a kind of awe in enthusiast circles. But before it was the 2JZ, it was the 1JZ, delivered in the JDM Mark III. This was a product of a collaboration between Toyota and Yamaha. Yamaha's involvement helped to optimize the cylinder head for better airflow and combustion characteristics. With their knowledge they'd amassed, Toyota rolled out the 2JZ GTE, a three liter inline six with a sequential twin turbo setup, propelling this car from zero to 100 in 4.6 seconds. The 2J, with its robust cast iron block, closed deck design, resilient internals and advanced cylinder head made this engine immensely tunable. Even when this car was new, tuners were swapping out turbos, injectors, ECUs and other parts to crank up the power. It wasn't long before people were talking about crazy horsepower figures like 800. To put this in perspective, Formula One cars of the day were making between seven and 800 horsepower. This was groundbreaking. Think about it. Toyota, known for their everyday cars like the Corolla, brought out a machine that laid waste to supercars, made more power than a Formula One if you wanted it to, and flaunted a design that even 30 years later demands your attention. Is that a Supra? As the Mark IV Supra made its debut on the streets, the tides of motorsport were changing. The age of the Group A was drawing to a close in 1993, replaced by new dynamic racing categories that threatened to overshadow established legends. Unfortunately, this meant that the Mark IV Supra couldn't make its mark in the Group A era. But destiny had other plans. The Mark IV was destined for a fresh battlefield. The prestigious Japan's Grand Touring Car Championship. From the very first race, the Supra was thrown into the deep end, pitted against the best of the best. The indomitable Nissan Skyline GDR, the precision engineered Honda NSX, the agile Mazda RX-7, the force of the Porsche 911, and even the McLaren F1, once the world's fastest production car. But the Supra was undeterred. By 1995, just a year after stepping onto the track, it secured two victories. 1997 brought it to the podium three times, and come 1999, it dominated with a staggering five first place finishes. But 
While the Supra was winning on Sunday, unfortunately, it wasn't selling very well on the Monday. The 1990s brought about economic challenges and recessions. Buying power was reduced, and luxury sports cars like the Supra were often seen as excess. Furthermore, the Supra's price steadily climbed, pushing it further out of reach for many of its fans. What began as an affordable performance machine was now competing price-wise with established luxury brands. The late 90s brought challenges for all high-performance vehicles. In the US, tightening emission regulations led to the Supra's departure from this market in 1998. In certain regions, the Mark IV Supra grappled with sluggish sales, leading to an abundance of stock at dealerships. It's hard to imagine. While these challenges did dent the Supra's immediate sales story, another narrative was forming fast on the big screen. Audiences were furiously flocking to cinemas. When Brian lost to Dominic Toretto, he owed him a 10 second car. I owe you a 10 second car. But after the kerfuffle with Johnny Tran and his mates, the Mitsubishi Eclipse was a no-go. So which car would Brian offer up as redemption? The Supra, of course. To Jay-Z and no shit. Like many of you watching, myself included, will know, the Fast and the Furious franchise highlighted the Supra in ways few could have anticipated. With its appearance in the film, the Supra didn't just gain attention, it became a poster car for an entire generation. Nice car. What's the retail on one of those? More than you can afford, pal. Ferrari. <laughs> of the film, the tuna culture saw an incredible surge. Big body kits, massive stereo systems and flashy modifications became the hallmark of the early 2000s. Many, like myself, after thumbing through magazines, were planning our next parts purchase. All in the name of customization and belonging to that scene. And the influence didn't just stop at the roads. Video games like Need for Speed and Gran Turismo prominently featured the Supra, introducing the iconic car to a new cohort of fans. However, as with all icons, the tides of time wait for no one. There came a moment of farewell. The world had moved forward and the Supra stepped out of the spotlight, becoming a relic of the past. But its spirit had never waned. It was kept alive by proud owners who polished their Supras like treasured gems and enthusiasts who breathed new life into those that had seen better days. This wasn't just a car. It was a bond uniting us in garages, on drag strips, at meetups, and across the digital world. As the years rolled by, the Supra's tail grew bigger than Toyota. It became our story. Our pride. And in its silence, the Supra was a more powerful reminder that Toyota didn't just make a car, they created a legacy that we, together, keep alive. You and me, it's ours. Seventeen years had passed by, and it is now 2019. A time of streaming wars, where shows binged in hours replaced weekly episodes. You're goddamn right. 
Virtual reality blurred the lines between the digital and the tangible. And our watches listened to our every heartbeat. In a landscape dominated by technological advancements, a car drove in that tugged at the heartstrings of pure automotive nostalgia. The new Toyota Supra. A name associated with performance, history and passion. But this wasn't the Supra that lingered in the memories of many. Enter the A90, Toyota's fresh take on the legend. But now, woven into its DNA, was the influence of BMW. A partnership that sparked both intrigue and contention. On the one hand, the partnership was a pragmatic move, leveraging BMW's expertise in crafting performance-orientated vehicles. On the other, for the purists, the move felt unsettling. Toyota, after all, had a legacy of forging its own path. The A90, with its sleek lines and modern aesthetics, looked every bit the part of a 21st century sports car. Yet it's under the bonnet where the debate raged. Powered by a BMW derived in line six, which was a nod to its predecessor, with 355 horsepower and a zero to 100 in just over four seconds, it certainly wasn't lacking in the performance department. But was it still a true Supra? The legend has returned. Supra is back. Better than ever. Thank you very much. Performance figures and test drives proved its caliber on the asphalt. But the heart and soul of a car, especially one as storied as the Supra, can't just be measured in horsepower or torque. Back in the 80s and 90s, the engineers at Toyota poured their blood, sweat and tears into crafting the Supra. Driven by the Kaizen mindset, and a burning desire to prove to the world they were not just some stuffy, boring economy car producer. Toyota succeeded in creating a car that not only earned deep respect and admiration, but also continues to be lusted after even decades later. Oh yeah. As a diehard super fan myself, it was initially difficult for me to accept that Toyota would choose to collaborate with BMW and seemingly risk the Supra's unique Japanese identity. However, there is more to the story than this. Tadasan, Toyota's chief engineer with a successful 8.6 under his belt, found himself steering the Supra's revival. He had to navigate the intricate world of modern car production while preserving the Supra's rich heritage. Nakamura-san, the chief engineer behind the Mark IV Supra and a firm believer in the inline six as the heart of a true sports car, played a guiding role in Tadasan's journey. In 2012, amid the 8.6's launch, Tadasan flew to Munich to explore a partnership with BMW. However, blending Toyota's meticulous Kaizen philosophy with BMW's bold approach to design was becoming a complex two-year dance back and forward. But Tadasan and his team continued to push forward, as without this bold step, the Supra might have remained a relic of the past. When both Toyota and BMW's values aligned, they worked together on a shared platform. Toyota set their sights on creating a car that could stand toe to toe with the Porsche Cayman, while BMW targeted the Boxster. Once the shared platform was created, both companies went their different ways. Each brand went on to create its distinct vision upon the mutual foundation. Toyota channeled the Supra's legacy, while BMW infused its unique flair. And so, while the path taken may stir mixed emotions, it's a path that ultimately led to the Supra's triumphant return, a testament to the unwavering spirit of Tadasan and his team, and a reminder that sometimes, to honour the past, we must embrace the future. Joining forces with BMW wasn't just about sharing costs or leveraging expertise, it was about tapping into a new world of opportunities. One of the most exciting outcomes a vibrant aftermarket scene. Tadasan, with his passion for customization and performance, envisioned a Supra that tuners would love to work on. He ensured the A90 Supra was designed with tuning in mind. By creating provisions for easy modifications and inviting tuning houses in Japan to offer their insights during its development, he laid a strong foundation. Moreover, with shared components between the Supra and its BMW counterparts, there's potential for a more extensive range of aftermarket parts. This not only benefits the Supra, but opens doors to a wider spectrum of customization of various vehicles. In essence, it was a carefully crafted strategy, ensuring the Supra was reborn into a world where it could thrive and evolve.
In a world rushing towards an electric future, the A90 Super might just represent one of the final crescendos of this age-old melody. There's an undeniable romance to the internal combustion engine. The raw harmony of metal, fire and fuel. It is a symphony that we've adored for over a century and I have had the personal privilege of working on my whole career. As the sun sets on the horizon and the dust settles, what the future holds for the Supra is still not clear. And even if the Supra's voice grows fainter in the loud noise of progress, what I do know for sure is, as long as the roads stretch ahead, and we tell the story forward. The legend of the Supra will continue to inspire. To all of you who feel the same passion, remember that every time you turn the key, you are not just starting a car. You are keeping the story alive.